Well, it's great to be, to be here with you and uh, to get to, uh, to know some of you and perhaps reacquaint ourselves with one another. I think we might have met some of you before somewhere or other. Um, and I, I, it's lovely to see that we're going to sing this song uh, after the talk, towards the end of the, the, uh, the talk, uh, Facing a Task Unfinished. So that's really the theme of... Uh, I think I'm doing the right thing here. That's the theme, really, of the, the three talks um, that I, I want to give over this, this weekend. Uh, the Gettys have put a, co a chorus to that old missionary hymn, uh, which has brought it back into circulation again, I think. Facing a task unfinished that drives us to our knees. A need that undiminished rebukes our slothful ease. Well, according to verse 5 of chapter 1, you notice there, Titus is facing a task unfinished. Paul has left him on the island of Crete to set right what was left undone. Now, Crete is a tiny little island uh, in, in the Mediterranean, a fraction of the size of Tasmania. Actually, it's not so tiny. It is the largest of the Greek islands. Homer, in his writings, talks about Crete of the Hundred Cities. That's the, the Greek poet Homer, not Homer Simpson. And it's, it's probably, that was probably an exaggeration because around the time of Titus, there were probably only about 40 centers of population on the island of Crete. And, and Paul's vision for Crete is to see every one of those cities, those population centers, those municipalities, whatever you want to call them, Paul's vision is to see every one of those cities with a healthy gospel church. That's not a bad vision to have, is it? The reason I left you on Crete, he says, was to set right what was left undone and to appoint elders in every town. That's the unfinished task, to see every one of those places with a healthy gospel church. And it's easier for us in Tasmania because there aren't so many of those places. Uh, Australia's vast. But before we put that into the too hard basket, let me just say this, it's not an impossible task. They don't know it yet, but there are people in every one of those communities who have been chosen by God from before the foundation of the world. There are people here in your community, in your suburb, here in Des Moines, who have been given to Christ to be saved before time began. Paul calls them the elect, God's elect. Uh, I like to call them the not yet Christians, and they're out there. They don't know who they are, but they're there waiting to be found. And according to what Paul says here in verse 1, that's what we're here for. If you're wondering why there's a church here in Des Moines, that's really what we're here for. It's for the faith of God's elect. It's to bring men and women and boys and girls to faith in Christ. That's the unfinished task. And it's, it's not, you see, you remember what Paul, when Paul was in Athens, uh, not in Athens, in Corinth, and he'd had a bit of a, uh, bad, a bit difficult time in, in Corinth, and God spoke to him, you remember, in the night uh, when he was really ready, I think, to throw in the towel and to move on. And God said to him, I have many people in this city. And we're told that he stayed for another 18 months, preaching and teaching the word of God. There are many people in this city of Sydney, many people in these neighborhoods around this church. There are lots, we, we talk about the chosen few sometimes, don't we? We Presbyterians are often called the chosen frozen. <laughs> uh, but the Bible says that they are more than can be numbered. They don't know who they are, and we don't know who they are but we are here for them. In every city, in every town, in every community in Australia, in all walks of life, in every strata, in every stratum of society, there are people who God has chosen to give to his son to be saved, and we're here for them. Somebody has said the church is the only society that exists for the benefit of non-members. That's what we're here for. That's why Paul left Titus on Crete. He wants Cretans to become Christians. And that's what we're here for. As a local church, as a denomination, that's what we're here for. We're, we're, we're not living in Christendom. We're living on a mission field. 
And it's time for us as a denomination, but also every local church in our denomination, it's time for us to start thinking like missionaries. How do we reach Australia? How do we reach people? That's why we need to plant churches. That's why we need to revitalize churches in every city. Not to fly the denominational flag. Those days are over. But to see people converted and built up in the faith. So that's the unfinished task. And, and let me say, we need to be doing it together, I think, with other like-minded Christians. We can't do this on our own. It's, it's a huge task ahead of us. You see, these, these pastoral epistles, Timothy, Titus, one and two Timothy, Titus, they're, they're, they're kind of pre-denominational. There's always a temptation for us you know, to justify our existence because we see the word elder here or we see the word presbyter as it is in Greek and we say Paul is a Presbyterian. <laughs> but that's, you don't read the Bible that way. That's, that's being anachronistic to, 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 to look at it in that way. These, these letters, weren't, they're pre-denominational. They weren't any denomination. And, and they're, they're, they're missional uh, documents, they're not manuals of church order. Sometimes we, we read the, the pastoral epistles as if, as if they're some kind of manual on church administration. So we see the word elder, uh, we hear presbyter in the Greek, and we think Paul's a Presbyterian, but then in the next verse, he talks about bishops or overseers, and we say, uh, episkopos, well, he's an Episcopalian, he's an Anglican. And of course, he's neither, because that's not what Paul is interested in. These pastoral epistles they're pre-denominational. Titus is told to appoint leaders, but there's no discussion about leadership structures or institutional processes. Instead, it's all about ensuring that the gospel is central to the everyday life of the church, so that the world can be reached for Christ. So that when Jesus comes back, he's not gonna ask us which abomination did you belong to, but he will ask you, what have you done to reach your fellow Australians for Christ. So let's think about that. How are we going to do that? It's not going to be easy. Uh, Crete wasn't an easy place for the gospel to take root. Today, of course, Crete's a, a much sought after holiday destination. Everyone wants to be a church planter on the island of Crete. <laughs> Who wouldn't want to be a, a church planter on the island of Crete? But back in the day, the culture of uh, the place was notoriously difficult. Uh, the towns were not tourist destinations. They were Wild West frontier towns. It was a place with a really bad reputation. One writer calls it a pirate culture. You can see that there in verse 12, can't you? Paul is quoting one of their own poets, a guy named Epimenides from the 6th century BC. Cretans are always liars. You can imagine how well that went down. Cretans are, or to Cretanize uh, in, in, in the ancient world was just synonymous with being a liar. Cretans are all, it's like to Welsh, you know, I'm Welsh, so I can say this. Uh, do you know what to Welsh means? It means to basically be dishonest. You know, Taffy was a Welshman, Taffy was a thief. Taffy came to our house and stole a leg of beef. And so to Welsh meant that you, you were dishonest. Well, that's a racial slur, isn't it? <laughs> and, and, and you could, you know, it sounds like what Paul is doing here is insulting people. Cretans are always liars, evil beasts. Lazy gluttons. Sounds like some kind of ethnic stereotype. You're not going to win many people by saying that sort of thing, Paul. And yet Paul insists on it. But he says in the very next verse, in the very next breath, he says, this saying is true. I know it's not what it says in the holiday brochures, but it's true. Cretans are always liars. Evil brutes, lazy gluttons. Tom Wright, in his little commentary, tries to soften it somewhat. Uh, he suggests that Paul is speaking tongue-in-cheek, that uh, this is his little joke, the, you know, the kind of joke that uh, academics or intellectuals play with, e play with each other, philosophers, you know, um, it's the sort of game that they play. Imagine a postcard with, um, on one side it says, the statement on the other side is true, and then you turn it over and it says, the statement on the other side is false. So what do you do with that? What do you make of it? Cretans are always liars, and Paul says, that's true. <laughs> what do you make of that? But Paul isn't really, he's not really, he's deadly serious. He's not playing games. He wants Titus to understand the enormity of the task ahead of him. It's 
not going to be easy. One of the best little commentaries I've, I've read on, on the book of Titus is by a guy called Tim Chester, who's one of my favorite authors. And uh, he describes it like this. He says, think about a culture where newspapers can't be trusted and politicians fiddle expenses. A harsh, selfish, racist culture where there's a fear of street crime. A, a culture where farm work and building work is done by migrants because local people don't want the jobs. A culture where obesity is a massive problem, if you pardon the pun. That, that's first century Crete. I mean, it's 21st century Australia too, isn't it? How do you reach a place like that? Compulsive liars, evil brutes, literally dangerous animals. Apparently, there were no dangerous animals on Crete, but the inhabitants more than made up for it. That was their reputation. Evil brutes, compulsive liars, lazy gluttons, feeding their faces, pampering themselves, living selfishly. How do you reach people like that? I want to say three things from the, these, these verses. First thing is this, you, you share the gospel, this is what are for. Second thing is you set up church, which you're, you're in the habit of doing, you're kind of adjusting things here at the moment, which I didn't realize when I prepared these talks, so I hope what I say uh, it speaks into what you're, you're doing right now. You, you share the gospel, you set up church, and you search for leaders, verses six to nine. So let me think, first of all, you share the gospel. That's what Paul is, is, is saying here in these opening verses, I think. He, he's kind of introducing himself to us in verses 1 to 4. Mark Twain uh, said, uh, apparently, uh, once, uh, two, the two most important days in your life, the two most important days in your life are the, is the day that you're born and the day you find out why you were born. And there's a sense in which Paul is sharing with us here that, that sense of uh, identity. He knows what he's for, doesn't he? He calls himself a slave of Jesus, a servant of God, and an apostle of Jesus Christ. For the faith of God's elect, that's what he's for. And the knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. In the hope of eternal life, which God who does not lie, everybody else lies in Crete, but God does not lie, and he's promised before the beginning of time. And he's now at his appointed season, brought this to light through the preaching entrusted to me by the command of God our Savior. Now, a key word in Titus is this word, epiphany. And, and the, that's the root of this, this expression, brought to light here. You, you've got it there in chapter 2 and in chapter 3, this word, epiphany. In, in chapter 2, Paul tells us that the grace of God offering salvation to all people has appeared. Uh, that's the verse that's set for in the, in the Anglican prayer book for, for Christmas. In Titus chapter 2, verses 11 to 14. It's about the incarnation. The grace of God has, in the coming of Christ into the world, the grace of God has appeared. And, and he tells us there in the next few verses that we, we're, we're to, to wait and we're to look forward to the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. His second coming, he's, he will appear with all his holy angels. So he has appeared and he will appear. But what Paul is telling us here in, in, in these verses, in verse 3 in particular, is this, that he now appears. And how does he now appear? He says, through the proclamation of the gospel entrusted to me. See what that means? Just think about that for a moment. There is such a close relationship between Jesus and the message about Jesus that when you share that message with people, Jesus appears in their lives. He appears like, like on a cold day, you can see your breath. It forms a, a cloud in the air. Something like that happens. I mean, much more profound than that. It's a terrible illustration, really, isn't it? Something like that happens when you share the gospel with your friends and neighbors. There's an epiphany. Jesus, he takes shape. He becomes real. He steps off the pages of the Bible into, into people's lives. Isn't that how you became a Christian? That's what happened for me. Jesus became real to me. I, 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 pretty sure you would have known about this ministry of Richard Borgonon. I know he's visited Sydney, and if David hasn't told you about him, it won't be long before he does, I'm sure. Uh, he, he, Richard Borgonon was a guy who worked in the city of London and uh, uh, had a really top job in the city of London and uh, was really involved with the ministry at St. Helens in the city. 
and would invite his friends and his colleagues along to you know, events in, in St. Helens. But he soon became sort of disillusioned because he, he found that when, when people were invited along to events, nothing much seemed to happen. And he got tired of it. And, and all the, you know, all the razzmatazz of, of putting on a program and uh, putting on a big event and all the money that's poured into that, it, it, it seemed to have very little, uh, little outcome. And, and so he, he discovered that he, what he would do, he would actually invite his colleagues, uh, you know, that way. He'd say, well, have you ever read, read, read about Jesus in the gospel? Would you like to, would you like to read the gospel with me? And then he, he divided up John's gospel into sections with the Bible on one page and questions on the other page and gave a book to, to his friend and he had a book himself. And he said, look, let's meet up for coffee and for 10, 15 minutes, we'll just go through a passage. And he said, people, he was surprised that people were willing to do that. And even more, even more surprising, he found that the more he did that, it, it was as if Jesus stepped off the page of the Bible into that person's life. And he, he had countless numbers of testimonies. And he, not only was he doing that in the city of London, at a very high level, it was done in the tenements in Glasgow with the same results. You can do that, can't you? It's easier, actually, to do that than to invite someone to church. It's a scary thing for someone who's not a Christian to come into a church, but it's not so scary to sit down alongside them and say, hey, have you ever read a gospel? Okay, can I read a gospel with you? Just take 10, 15 minutes over coffee. You can do that in school. You can do that as a student. You can do that, you know, playing bowls as an older person or whatever you do as an older person. It's... Perhaps you know the story of, uh, do you know the story of Fletcher Christian and the mutiny on the bounty? Everybody knows about the, the mutiny on the bounty. The full story is not so well known. Uh, after they, they ditched the captain and the officers, the mutineers sailed off on the bounty looking for an island paradise. And they ended up on Pitcairn Island, a remote island in the Pacific. They took all they could from the ship and they set it on fire and sunk it. And then they let loose all their passions. They were on this island paradise. They were free now to do whatever they wanted. Uh, they began to make alcohol from the plants that grew there. Men spent days, even weeks, completely drunk. Soon fighting and killing broke out. They became like animals in their behavior. One man went mad and jumped over a cliff. And godliness reigned. Things got so bad that one night the women and children seized the guns and barricaded themselves off to protect themselves. Eventually, only two of the original mutineers were left, Edward Young and Alexander Smith. And then something strange happened. The grace of God appeared on that island. The truth that leads to godliness. I'll tell you how it happened. Young found the old ship's Bible from the bounty. Smith couldn't read, and strangely, in one of their more sober moments, Young began to teach him to read from the Bible. They started uh, to learn reading the Bible through from Genesis, and their, their reading of the Bible began to affect them. They, they realized that their lives were an offense to God, and they began to change. It took time uh, to read. The children on the island noticed the change first. Not, not long afterwards, Young died, and, but Smith read on. By now, he was... He'd learned to read for himself, and as he came into the New Testament, something remarkable happened to him as he read about Jesus. This is, this is what, what he wrote about his experience. He said, I'd been working like a mole for years, and suddenly it was as if the doors flew wide open, and I saw the light, and I met God, and the burden of my sin rolled away, and I found new life. From that moment on, everything changed on Pitcairn Island. Smith began to read the scriptures to the women and children. In 1805, 18 years after the original mutiny, a ship from Boston came across Pitcairn Island. The captain came ashore. When he got back to Boston, he reported that in all his travels, he had never met a people who were so good and gracious. They had a love and peace about them that he had never seen anywhere before. What happened? The grace of God had appeared on that island redeeming these people from wickedness, making them into a people eager to do what is good. That's Paul's vision for Crete. That should be our vision for Australia, don't you think? You see, we want to see Cretans becoming Christians. 
through the preaching of the gospel, through the sharing of our testimony. And see, the Greeks wanted to civilize them. Paul wants to evangelize them. The Greeks wanted to bring down the crime statistics on the island, just like we do. <laughs> I mean, it's just frightening when you ever turn on the news, the, the things that are happening in Australia right now. The, the Greeks wanted to, to do something about that. They wanted to bring down the f crime statistics. They wanted good public behavior. They wanted people to feel safe in their own, own homes. This is what Greek culture wanted, but Greek culture couldn't produce it. Education and legislation and politics can't do it. No voice to parliament can rid Australia of racism or right the wrongs of the past 200 years. Only the gospel can do that. Only the gospel can change Cretans into Christians. So you preach the gospel. You share about Jesus. You tell people about him. That's where it begins. You don't put on programs necessarily. I'm not against programs. But all of us need to be missionally minded. And, and anybody can share the fact about Jesus, his incarnation and his life and his death and his resurrection. We share the gospel. Second thing is this, you set up church. See, look again at verse 5. The reason I left you in Crete, Paul says, is so that you might put in order what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every town, as I directed you. Now, Paul isn't a hit-and-run merchant. He's not a freelance evangelist. He doesn't simply want converts. He wants to make disciples. And, and to gather these converts into churches. That's why he's left uh, Titus on Crete. And I want to say this, conversion, it isn't, it, it, it isn't, your conversion isn't complete unless it ends up in church. Evangelism and, and, and church go together. So you remember what Luke says there in that summary verse in Acts chapter 2. You remember what he says, the Lord added to their numbers daily those who were being saved. Who did the Lord add to the church? Who did the Lord add to the church? Those who were being saved. Those, that's how you, how you form a church. There's no nominalism there in the New Testament. Those who are being saved. But if you are being saved, if God has begun a work in your life, you will end up in church. Until you end up in a church, your conversion is incomplete. Paul has left Titus to set up church in every town. The word elder is presbyter. He wants presbyters in every place. <laughs> Elders in every city. That's, and that's his strategy for reaching Crete. And notice, it's not a suggestion. It's, it's an apostolic directive. You see what he says? I've left you there to appoint elders in every town as I directed you. See, see that's what I meant earlier when I said I'm a, a Presbyterian with a small P, not with a capital P. <laughs> You see, what for us Presbyterians is little more than a denominational distinctive, for Paul was a missional strategy. Not only in Crete, but everywhere he went, around the Mediterranean, this is how he set out to win the world for Christ. We call it the Pauline cycle. He'd go to a place, preach the gospel, gather the converts, and then sometime later he'd go back and appoint indigenous, homegrown leaders. That's his vision for Crete. We've got a committee in the denomination called the Mission to Australia. It's just basically a, a, a committee that m receives reports from wherever we are in Australia. It doesn't do anything. This should be our mission. To see a healthy gospel church in every city, in every suburb, in every community. Whether it's by planting new churches or revitalizing old churches. But healthy churches need healthy leaders, and clearly that's Paul's great concern here in this chapter. He wants to straighten things out because, it, you know, when you read on in the chapter, in the second half of the chapter, as we saw, the churches on Crete were a bit of a mess. They needed straightening out. What churches there were had been infiltrated by toxic leaders who were ruining people's lives. Uh, the churches on the island had become infected with legalism and, and Jewish myths and Christ plus teaching, and that needs sorting out. So share the gospel, set up church, and a vital part of that, of course, will be to search for leaders. Leadership in the local church is vital to the carrying out of God's mission to the world. So appoint elders, he says. And elders are called elders for a reason, because they're elderly. 
they're old, they're seniors. Of course, that's all comparative. Uh, people didn't live to the sort of age that we live today, back then. But it's not really because they're old in years, they're, they're, they're mature. I love what Spurgeon says about this. He says, some are born with their beards already grown. You don't have to wait until you're 70 to be an elder. It's about spiritual maturity. The picture of an elder here is basically the picture of a, of a, mat a mature follower of Jesus. It's what we should all aspire to, isn't it? It's what we should all aim for. In, in one of his books, Leonard Ravenhill talks about a group of tourists visiting a, a picturesque village somewhere in the Balkans, and, and they come across a toothless old peasant leaning over the, the fence. And in a rather patronizing way, one of the tourists say to him, uh, were any great men born in this village? Nope said the old man, only babies. <laughs> growth, growth takes time, doesn't it? So Paul says, don't lay hands on anyone suddenly and don't put a, no a novice into leadership. But on the other hand, you remember he says to Timothy, don't let anyone despise your youth. I, I, I'm, I'm a little bit not too happy about the, the current kind of emphasis in our circles on, on raising leaders. It's all about raising leaders. That's not what Paul was about. He was all about bringing the elect to faith and making disciples of the converts. But you know, in a lot of our churches, it's you know, find a few gods, find a few guys who are kind of self-starters, we used to call them Blokes worth watching, but there are bloke S's out there who are worth watching as well. And, and, and invest into those people. And then there's a pipeline, and they, they, they go to Bible college, and then they come out of Bible college. That's not the way to do it. That's not the way Paul did it. The way to raise up leaders is to disciple the whole congregation. To disciple everyone in your church. I, I heard a guy called Duncan Forbes, I think in London, saying, using the illustration of uh, making chocolate chip cookies. Y you know how to make chocolate chip cookies? You mix the dough and you put the chocolate chips into the dough. You don't have a, a chocolate chip dispenser. Uh, some churches are like that. They're looking for leaders. They're raising up leaders and that's all they ever go on about. Raising up leaders. and It's like having a chocolate chip dispenser. No, no. You, you have to bake the whole dough. And, and as, you, as you do that, and you put it in the oven, the dough rises and you end up with a cookie which has chocolate chips that have been raised up. Some are on the top, some are inside, and, and they surprise us and we don't always see them eventually until we crunch on them. <laughs> but the point is this, you see, you need the whole dough for leaders to be raised up. You, you, you have to disciple the whole congregation. You can't just scoop up a handful of chocolate chips. The gospel has to do its work first in people's lives. That's why Paul, when he, he went to these places, preached the gospel, saw people converted, gathered the converts, then later he went back, giving time for the dough to, raise, to rise, giving time for young converts to, to mature before he appointed them as leaders. So what do we look for in, in these leaders? Uh, I, don't worry, I'm not going to go uh, you know, right through every single thing that's here. I just want to pick out some of the main words. Os, Os Guinness, in his book, Dining with the Devil, quotes a Japanese businessman. He said, whenever I meet a Buddhist leader, I meet a holy man. Whenever I meet a, a Christian leader, I meet a manager. That's very telling, I think, isn't it? <laughs> don't misunderstand me. Christian leaders are managers. One of the functions of effective leadership is to oversee God's flock, to manage God's household. Someone has said a leader does the right thing and a manager does the thing right. And so we need both those things happening in our church. Don't we? That's why a plurality of elders, everything in the New Testament, every church there has a plurality of elders. So there's a mix of gifts in the, in the, in the oversight of that church. But whatever we call our leaders, the emphasis here is on character. Paul would rather have no leader at all than one whose character doesn't match the message. Leaders set the tone of a church. What kind of a church do we want to be? It'll show itself in the sort of leaders 
that we've put in place. So let me just pick out three words out of these, these verses, verses six to nine. See what it says in verse six? An elder must be blameless. Blameless. Not, not in a legalistic, pharisaical kind of way. You know, Paul, you know, Saul of Tarsus, before he became a Christian, he, he, he described himself as, as to righteousness under the law, I was blameless, he said. But that kind of pharisaical like uh, um, uh, righteousness, is, it, it, it's, it's like painting by numbers, if you know what I mean. You know, you have a, 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 I've got grandchildren now, so I know a little bit about this. You have an outline of some great work of art, and, and you paint between the lines according to the numbers. There's a, a law code for you to follow, telling you what color to choose for each square. And, and the end product of, is, is wooden and lifeless and artificial, isn't it? Totally lacking in any kind of flair or creativity. You're very unlikely to hang such a painting on your fridge door unless, of course, it's done by one of your grandkids. <laughs> that's, that's parasaical, legalistic righteousness. It's holiness by numbers. Cold, clinical, and correct. Mark Twain describes such people as good in the worst sense of the word. Like stainless steel, clean but cold. Correct but sterile. Reading between the lines, there were such people around on Crete, they, those belonging to the circumcision group. Ellen Glasgow, uh, in her autobiography, tells of her father, who was a Presbyterian elder, Full of rectitude and rigid with duty, he was entirely unselfish, and in his long life, he never committed a pleasure. Blamelessness, blameless doesn't mean that. Blameless is gospel holiness. It, it's warm and attractive, bubbling up from inside you, rising out of your relationship with Jesus and the forgiveness of your sins. Now, isn't that the kind of church you are to be? And those are the sort of leaders that you need to put in place if you're going to reach your city for Jesus. Blameless. Not sinless, but unimpeachable. How important that is in our, our current climate where the public is so deeply distrustful of church leaders. And here's another word to challenge us. Hospitable. Look at verses 7 and 8. There are a whole list of virtues and vices there, but it's not a checklist. These are not boxes to tick but symptoms to help you understand what's in your heart. Are you arrogant, proud, angry, violent, overbearing, greedy, like everyone else in Crete? Or are you gospel-hearted, hospitable, one who loves what is good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined? In other words, are you a product of your culture or a product of the gospel? Has your heart been warmed? Has your heart been changed by the grace of God? Hospitable, you see, hospitable means that. It means welcoming to outsiders and strangers. Those are the kind of people that Paul tells Titus to look out for and to put into positions of leadership. Chuck Swindle in his book, Grace Awakening, tells the story of uh, Thomas Je Jefferson, who was the American president. And uh, he, he talks about how he and his men were... Um, had, had across a swollen river on horseback and a stranger approached the, the president and asked him if he would ferry him across. And the, the president agreed without hesitating. hesitating. And after they made it across safely to the other side, one of the president's men's, men asked the stranger, why did you ask the president to carry you across? Shocked, the man said, I didn't know he was the president. All I know is that on some of your faces was written the answer no. And on some of your faces, the answer yes. He had a yes face. Isn't that the kind of leader to look for? Not, not a yes man, but a man with a yes face. J.C. Riley and his five Christian leaders gives the testimony of a wealthy woman from New York who was converted under George Whitfield's preaching. No one who ever saw him, says Riley, could ever doubt that he enjoyed his religion. Mr. Whitfield, she said, was so cheerful that it tempted me to become a Christian. <laughs> Isn't that the kind of church you want to be? Isn't that the kind of people we want to be? hospitable, people with yes faces. Someone has said a leader is a person, I, I, I like this, a leader is a person with a magnet in his heart, or her heart, and a compass in their head, a magnet in the heart to attract and to draw people in. 
and a compass in the head to give direction. Look at verse 9. Holding firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught so that he'll be able both to encourage others with sound teaching and refute those who oppose it. Like Calvin says, a pastor needs two voices, one to gather the sheep and one to drive away the wolves. We need to be people like that, don't we? We need to have a grasp. We need to be people who have grasped the gospel for ourselves. We know what we believe and why we believe it. And we're able to guard the gospel from false teachers. And we need to know how to give the gospel away. That's the task Paul gives to Titus. That's the sort of people we need to be. People with the gospel in our heads, in our hearts, and in our homes. If the truth leads to godliness and godliness becomes an advertisement for the truth, then godly truth tellers become an urgent priority. So share the gospel, set up church, and search for leaders like that. That's the unfinished task. Let's pray.